Hi, I am Dr. Sridhar and welcome to the live stream. I'll be discussing the 8th edition of the National Neonatal Resuscitation Program. You might be aware that on my channel there is a playlist on NRP and I would request you to go through that once we finish this. And uh, there are individual videos, I'll be mentioning them as we go along the NRP itself. <coughs> so the 8th edition uh, was introduced and uh, we are using it almost for a year now. We have the updates mainly in the form of revising the pre-birth questions to include cord management, reordering the initial steps to better reflect the common practice, uh, the recommendation to use an electronic cardiac monitor earlier in this uh, algorithm, simplifying the suggested dose of epinephrine, increasing the flush volume for the intravascular dose of epinephrine and extending the duration of resistive effort for babies with an absent heart rate. So this is to go over these changes. Of course, the NRP 7th edition has not been used currently and we are in the 8th edition already. So we'll focus on the main changes in the 8th edition rather than comparing with the 7th edition. So in terms of cord management, as we know, delayed cord clamping has a huge importance and uh, there are some situations where delayed cord clamping may not be uh, recommended like in IUGR babies or if there is any maternal bleeding concerns and so on. So to consider that we have the fourth question. So the pre-birth questions include gestational age, whether the amniotic fluid is clear, whether there are additional risk factors and umbilical cord management plan has been added. So the how many babies part will come under the risk factors itself. So you can eliminate that. The reordering of the initial steps is very sensible because here it was all mentioned but in a chaotic pattern. So warm and maintain temperature, position, airway, clear secretion, dry and stimulate. So there is no real coordinated uh, rhythm to this. So currently it is more coordinated. So you have warm which is receiving under the warmer, drying the baby which is a natural response we do. Stimulate the baby which happens usually as we dry position uh, the airway which is an automatic rep response and it's important to open the airway before we do anything else and suction if needed which you would notice when you position the baby. The use of the electronic cardiac monitor is recommended earlier. The previous uh, one was to uh, suggest that the in the baby is needing chest compression. However, in the current algorithm when the alternative airway becomes necessary a cardiac monitor is recommended. Uh, the epinephrine dose for the intravenous or intraosseous, uh, the flush dose was 0.5 to 1 ml normal saline previously, but many of us feel that uh, in clinical practice we would give 3 to 5 ml. So 3 ml has been the flush volume irrespective of weight and gestational age. And the dosage of the epinephrine has been simplified rather than saying 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 milligram per kilogram or 0.1 to 0.3 ml per kilogram of 1 in 10,000. It's now standardized at 0.2 ml per kilo or 0 0.02 milligram per kilogram. Of course, the range still stays. So if the weight is not exactly known, you can adjust within that range. And in terms of the endotracheal dose, uh, point, instead of 0.05 to 0.1 milligram or 0.5 to 1 ml per kilo, the dose is now 1 ml per kilo as a standard. So it makes it easier to calculate in the emergency scenario. The frame, time frame for cessation of resuscitation efforts is quite difficult to judge and obviously the most important factor here is to be clear that the resuscitation efforts was appropriately done. So in the seventh edition it said if there is a confirmed absence of heart rate after 10 minutes of resuscitation, it's reasonable to stop resuscitative efforts. However, the decision should be individualized. And the current eighth edition says, if confirmed absence of heart rate after all the appropriate steps are performed, we consider cessation around 20 minutes after birth. Again, the decision is individualized, but you involve the patient as well as parent and contextual factors. So this is about the update and there is a separate video on the update as well, if you're interested. Some basic facts related to neonatal resuscitation. So, most newborns make the transition from uh, intrauterine to extrauterine life without intervention. So more than 95% of the times a baby would uh, try, I mean, transition safely. I say more than 95% because even though the, some babies may need IPPV, these are babies, some of them, most of them are in primary apnea, 
and they will manage on their own with time. Uh, before birth, pulmonary blood vessels in the fetal lungs are tightly constricted. The alveoli are filled with fluid and not air. Newborn resuscitation is usually needed because of respiratory failure in contrast to older children and adults, uh, especially adults where cardiac component comes in as well. Cardiac arrest due to heart attack and things are not common in children. So mostly it's a respiratory failure. And here it's a respiratory failure related to the failed transition to extra train life. The most important and effective step considering this is to ventilate <coughs> the baby's lungs. So most of the steps in the NRP would be focused on ensuring that you are ventilating the lungs appropriately before you move on to uh, anything else related to that. Five percent of the term newborns will receive positive pressure ventilation and some of these uh, babies are in primary apnea and they may respond to stimulation alone as well as I mentioned earlier. Two percent of the term newborns will be intubated. So most of the babies who are in secondary apnea will need intubation and this will be around two percent. One to three babies per thousand live births will <coughs> receive chest compression or emergency medication. So this is fitting with the same group of babies where we say the HIE risk is one to three per thousand. So most of these babies who are severe asphyxia will come in this category. And as we will discuss moving on, teamwork, leadership and effective communication are critical to successful resuscitation of the newborn. Just a quick run through of the fetal circulation. Again, uh, there is a detailed video on the fetal circulation as well as the importance of delayed cot lamping. Here I am going to stress on the impact of delayed cot lamping. So the umbilical vein brings in the oxygenated blood from the placenta. Uh, most of the oxygenated blood is taken through the eustachian valve to the ascending aorta which supplies the brain. The right ventricle pumps blood into the uh, pulmonary vessels. This is oxygenated blood and uh, instead of going through the lungs, only 10% of it goes through the lungs which is fluid filled. The rest of it is shunted through the ductus to the descending part of the iota. So the oxygen level drops a little bit because the vena cable blood return gets mixed in the right atrium and so its saturation is little lower compared to what goes through the eustachian valve to the upper part of the body. The pulmonary artery, the umbilical arteries bring back the deoxygenated blood and this is the fetal circulation. After birth, when the cord gets clamped, there is an increase in the systemic vascular resistance. The PDA closes, the shunting through the foramen ovale stops and uh, the ductus venous is constricts as well. So the umbilical venous circulation obviously stops. So instead of being a parallel circuit, I mean the uh, parallel circuit, the blood circulation becomes, uh, the lung starts opening up as well. So the uh, pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation start running in parallel as it happens after birth. The fetal lung is filled with fluid. Part of it gets absorbed if there is a labor process and when there is an absence of the labor process like a, um, a cesarean section which is elective or a precipitate labor, there is not enough time for this fluid to get absorbed so the baby comes with more fluid in the lungs. When the lung starts inflating, the air opens the lungs and this is how the blood vessels will open up when the oxygen exposure happens the vessels which are constricted open up as well. So both the lung volume increasing and the lung blood vessels opening up happens at the same time. Oxygen is a stimulant for the blood vessels to open up. When the baby has an exposure to asphyxial insult, uh, it goes through these sequences. You can review my uh, video in the NRP uh, pro I mean playlist on primary and secondary apnea. So we have uh, initial response when the asphyxial stimulus starts here, rapid breathing. Then there is cessation of breathing called primary apnea. Most of the babies who are born bluish and not breathing at birth are coming in primary apnea. They respond to stimulation. So while we are drying and stimulating, the babies may start moving. If they are still not breathing, they do respond to IPPV quickly. The heart rate is maintained in the initial stage of primary apnea, but then it starts uh, dropping later on. After the primary apnea, the baby may start irregular gasping as the uh, brain stem centers start taking over. So uh, during this stage, if the baby is born and is uh, kept with the airway open, they may start responding as well. And if there is no uh, response during this time, the asphyxial stimulus persists. There is a secondary apnea, which is the terminal apnea. If you don't intervene here, the baby will die. So the heart rate as the hypoxia persists, starts dropping and uh, the blood pressure continues to drop as well in these stages. The longer the secondary apnea continues, the lower the heartbeat. So 
when the blood pressure is dropping this is the reason the baby with secondary apnea comes out pale because the perfusion to the body the skin and the brain is affected so the baby is hypotonic and pale so if you have a pale floppy baby it indicates secondary apnea if you have not called for help this is a good time to call for help the algorithm itself can be uh, divided into five main blocks so we have the initial rapid evaluation where we determine whether the baby can stay with the mother or should be moved to a radiant warmer for further evaluation uh, the next step is assessing the airway as we said the uh, airway kept kept open during the initial stage of assessment itself and we need to do whatever is needed to keep the open airway we assess the baby's breathing and if the baby is apneic or has a sluggish respiration with bradycardia we have to give positive pressure breathing the breathing support can also be in the form of cpap or supplemental oxygen if the baby is breathing but not maintaining the oxygenation coming to circulation if this severe bradycardia persists despite the assisted ventilation circulation is supported by performing chest compression and this should be coordinated with ppv and if there is no uh, response to these then we may need drugs and mainly it's epinephrine and volume which we will be discussing later so this is the run through of the algorithm i uh, mentioned the initial questions when i told about the update so we have the uh, questions of uh, whether it's uh, clear liker whether there is a term or premature baby any other risk factors where we get all the details and the plan for cot clamping after the baby is born we have to uh, i mean start the initial uh, assessment steps so we have a team briefing beforehand if possible we review the antenatal counseling risk factors and so on and we check the equipment it's very important to be prepared uh, you can review the previous uh, series for equipment check nothing much has changed in that so at the time of birth we assess the baby for term gestation to confirm whether uh, the dates were wrong you might have a premature baby by mistake Uh, you may have good tone and whether the baby is breathing or crying uh, if the answers to these is yes then the baby can stay with the mother for the initial steps routine care and ongoing evaluation so obviously most of us are going for bfha and skin to skin care becomes important at the stage the labor room temperature should be maintained throughout this period so the baby doesn't get cold if any of the responses is no we have to warm dry stimulate position the airway and suction if needed Uh, if the baby is apneic or gasping and the heart rate is less than 100 uh, or the heart rate is less than 100 then you need to start ipppv as we mentioned in this algorithm you consider the cardiac monitor the moment the baby needs ppv pulse oximeter of course is part of this if uh, the answer to this is no then you may consider uh, cpap uh, suctioning positioning and free flow oxygen so any of these as suits if it's a premature baby with labored breathing you would consider cpap more if the heart rate is less than 100 despite effective ipppv uh, then you ensure adequate ventilation the mr sopa steps can be done you consider endotracheal tube or laryngeal mask uh, cardiac monitor if you have not done that already and uh, if the heart rate is uh, less than 60 at this stage then you would start uh, chest compression as well so if you have not already intubated or you don't have the alternative airway if you're not able to intubate laryngeal mask is an option so you consider this definitely at this stage uh, if you can't intubate or intubation fails you don't need to panic you continue the same steps with uh, effective mask uh, intubation uh, mask application you may have two people to hold lma is a blessing and uh, make sure the lma is available in these scenarios and your team is trained to use it uh, 100% oxygen is important once you go to the chest compression stage we have to prepare and insert the uvc because the next step would be the iv medication so if the heart rate is less than 60 epinephrine every 3 to 5 minutes in cycle so the first dose can be given endotracheal and subsequently it's given through the uvc uh, if you manage a uvc if not uh, intraoseous route is applied we have the target oxygen saturation table so you don't expect the oxygenation to improve immediately the baby if the fetus is coming from a hypoxic environment so at birth it's 60 to 65 at uh, up to 1 minute at 2 minutes you expect 65 to 70 3 minutes 70 to 75 4 minutes 75 to 80 and remember that it takes around 5 minutes to reach 80% so you don't need to rush to increase the fio2 if the baby saturation is picking up slowly you can wait provided the rest of the parameters are stable and at 10 minutes you reach 85 to 95% 
the initial oxygen concentration for PPV, if the baby is uh, 35 weeks and above, you start with room air, and if the baby is less than 35 weeks, you start with 21 to 30%. There is an option for the babies who are less than 28 weeks to go for 40% and then titrate as well. So the key behavioral skills are important as well, and uh, it's very important that we have skill drills in the unit so all of you are used to working with each other. So if you are new to a team, especially this aspect is very important. Know your environment, know the location of the resuscitation equipment, how to access it, know how to call for help, how to call the code in your unit and who is available to support. Use all the available information. Remember to have a preparedness, as the obstetrician, as a midwife, know the prenatal history, including maternal complications, maternal medications and risk factors. Anticipate and plan. So perform a pre-resuscitation team briefing to ensure all team members know the clinical situation, assign roles and responsibilities, discuss an action plan in the event of complications. Identify the team leader before birth. Effective leaders will clearly articulate goals, delegate tasks. This is very important. You don't take all the work yourself. Uh, you have to lead, you have to have a vision of the whole project. Include the other team members in assessment and planning. Think out loud. This is a stage where the team members may contribute. And uh, when you say out loud, if there is any disagreement, there will be effective feedback. This also encourages the team to think together with you. Maintain the situational awareness. You may be missing something. You may need to call for an X-ray early. You may need to get additional support, for example, for a chest drain if there is an air leak and so on. Hand over the leadership to another team member if uh, they may become involved in a process, if you may have to in involve in the procedure as a leader. Effective communication is very important as well. And uh, when you work together, you might know your team members by name. So it's clear who has to do it when you name someone. So you are making them accountable and also dividing, delegating responsibly. They share the information actively and this is part of the uh, above mentioned steps. Inform the team if you identify a problem. So it doesn't mean that only the leader has to pick up a problem or an error or a safety concern. Any member of the team has responsibility and the le leader is a human being as well. So don't hesitate to chip in and add uh, to the team's contributions. Order the medications by name, dose and route be clear. Ask for closed loop communication. If you have said something, they repeat the same and confirm that it is done. Uh, use concise and clear language, verify information. Ensure that the changes in information and assessment are shared with all the team members. Include the family in the communication. So the person doing the documentation might be the one to do it or the leader might have to quickly go if the situation needs their support. Delegating workload appropriately is important. Do not duplicate work or use more resources than necessary. Overcrowding is not good in this scenario as well. Change the task assignment depending on the skill set and what is required. Do not allow one person to become overloaded with tasks and do not allow the team to become fixated on a simple single task. That's why the leader has to have a full awareness of whatever is happening. They shouldn't be focusing on just one aspect. If the intubation fails, you have to go to the next step, continue IPPV, go for LMA, call for an anesthetist who might help you intubate. So all this should be going in the background. Allocate attention wisely, so maintain situation awareness by scanning and reassessing quickly and monitor each other's performance. This is very important if you have new members in your team, make sure that they are doing the steps properly. Chest compression is often done incorrectly, so make sure it's done. Whether the mask seal is appropriate, whether they are rotating, taking turns so that one person doesn't get tired with the chest compression. Use available resources, so know what personnel are available know what additional supplies are available and how to access them and call for additional help. So as I said, if you think the baby is pale and floppy, it's very important you get additional help. If it's a premature baby, if it's multiple pregnancies, obviously you don't delay. The earlier you call, the better because the other person may take time to come. Maintain professional behavior. Remember that everyone is contributing. The aim of the team is to contribute positively to the baby's resuscitation. So. Use respectful verbal and non-verbal communication. If you lose your uh, cool and start shouting, the others start getting edgy, they may get stressed and they may not perform well. Actively seek and offer assistance, support and promote teamwork. Any good team will have a debriefing session at the end of a resuscitation and this is a very good practice. Uh, learn from the debriefing, don't criticize people. Always review what is documented as well and. Uh, support the team in uh, documenting appropriately so they know what to do. 
respect and value your team as well and appreciate good contributions uh, irrespective of the result. So when we talk about anticipating and preparing, we have to identify the risk factors, what is expected gestational age. So in preterm babies, as we will discuss later, there are specific steps. Is the liker clear? Are there additional risk factors? What is the cord management plan? And some newborns without any apparent risk factors will require resuscitation. Every birth should be attended by at least one qualified individual who can initiate resuscitation, whose responsibility is to manage the newborn baby. So sometimes the midwives in the labor room may be managing the newborn, but they should be able to call the Nikunas and the doctor for help immediately. If there are risk factors, at least two qualified individuals, usually the Nikunas with the uh, Niku doctor will be present solely to manage the baby. Uh, the risk factors will decide how many of these, for example, twins or triplets, you need more. A qualified team will full resuscitation skill should be identified and immediately available. They should be present at the time of birth if advanced resuscitation is anticipated. So don't delay calling them because the equipment check also needs to be sure completed. There are multiple risk factors that increase the likelihood of neonatal resuscitation being needed, but there are also some situations where you may not anticipate and the baby comes out flat. So labor is not predictable. You can review my lecture on perinatal asphyxia to understand uh, how these factors play a role. So antepartum factors, prematurity, post-maturity, preeclampsia, eclampsia, maternal hypertension, multiple gestation, fetal anemia. Polyhydramnias, oleohydramnias may indicate underlying birth anomalies as well fetal hydrops, fetal macrosomia, intrauterine growth restriction, significant fetal malformations or anomalies, and no prenatal care becomes a risk because any of these could exist in the absence of prenatal care and you may not know. Intrapartum risk factors, emergency cesarean section, forceps or vacuum delivery, breach or abnormal presentation, fetal heart rate abnormality category two or three, maternal general anesthesia, maternal magnesium, because the baby may come out floppy, placental abruption, intrapartum bleeding, APH is a possibility and asphyxia is associated, chorioamnionitis, maternal sedation, especially with opioids within four hours. But remember that the sedation effect can persist longer in some mothers. Uh, we cannot predict the metabolic pattern. And so sometimes I've seen sedation even after eight hours. Shoulder dystocia, meconium stained amniotic fluid and prolapsed umbilical cord. So most of these are conveyed by the obstetric team. As I said, you have to be prepared for a situation where you may not be able to anticipate. The fetal heart rate changes are there in a separate video as well. You can search on my channel. In terms of the pre-resuscitation team briefing, we have to assess the risk factors, identify the leader, which in usual situations is quite clear cut. Anticipate potential complications. So suppose you have twin pregnancy in a premature baby uh, pregnancy, you have to prepare to give uh, surfactant, be ready to intubate if needed and so on. Uh, most of the time we don't bring surfactant to the labor room unless it's an extreme preterm because the prophylactic surfactant concept has changed and most of the labor rooms are situated next to the NICU so you may be able to get the surfactant soon. Otherwise we can stabilize the baby on uh, non-invasive ventilation, take to the NICU assess and decide on surfactant. Delegate the tasks, uh, identify who will document events as they occur, determine what supplies and equipment will be needed and identify to call for additional help. A team leader we already discussed should have mastery of the algorithm and effective leadership skills. He doesn't need to be the most senior member and the leader can change in the middle of the resuscitation process but with a clear handover. The communication skills should include clear directions to specific individuals using names if possible, sharing the information, delegating responsibility to ensure coordinated care and maintain a professional environment. The team members should all be encouraged to contribute and uh, we should be aware of the entire clinical picture or big picture. Situation awareness for the entire team, especially the leader is important. And we should be able to change track. You may be thinking of something, but immediately change track. If you think a tube is blocked, you suggest and uh, remove the tube and back the baby because if the tube is blocked, nothing will work. So such things should be based on situation awareness. You don't get stuck to one road rhythm. You just be quick to change if you think of something which might work. and. You can say that loud and take the team's concurrence as well. I'll also remember use of the ETCO to stensor to throughout the uh, resuscitation scenario till you shift to the NICU so that the tube is dislodged, you will pick it up sooner. Closed loop communication means that you direct the request to a specific individual 
by name. You make eye contact, speak clearly in a complete fashion. After the instruction, ask the receiver to report back as soon as the task is completed. So they may repeat what they understood and also say that they have done that process so the loop is complete. In terms of equipment, uh, you have different ways to remember it. So uh, remember that you need equipment to warm, including preheated warmer, warm towels or blankets, temperature sensor, hat, plastic uh, bag or plastic wrap for babies less than 32 weeks, thermal mattress for babies less than 32 weeks. And don't forget the OR or labor room temperature should be adjusted beforehand. If you anticipate a preterm delivery, it should be at least uh, 24 degrees. Clear the airway, you need bulb syringe, suction catheter, larger size preferably and the wall section set at 80 to 100 millimeter mercury. A tracheal aspirator in case meconium stain liquor with an airway obstruction is noted. We need a stethoscope for auscultation. For ventilation, we need the flow meter set to 10 liters, oxygen blender set to 21%, uh, PPV device which we will discuss later, preterm size mask and term size masks orogastric tube for emptying the stomach with the 20 ml syringe, laryngeal mask, uh, a 5 ml syringe if needed for inflation. Uh, this depends on the model of the LMA you are using. Uh, orogastric tube uh, if insertion port is present in case you are planning to do salsa for surfactant through the laryngeal mask, cardiac monitor and leads as well. In terms of uh, oxygenation, equipment to give free flow oxygen, pulse oximeter with sensor and cover and target oxygen saturation table. So this is obviously usually attached to the warmer, the target oxygen saturation table and keep the oxygen levels as you need according to the gestation of the baby. For intubation, you need laryngoscope with appropriate size blades. So size zero for preterm, size one for term. And if you have extreme preterm, size double zero. A stillet is optional according to the experience of the user. Endotracheal tubes of the appropriate size, so 2.53 and 3.5. Two size tubes are very difficult to get and most of the time we need to change them once you go to the unit because very difficult to suction and also secure them. So always try to get a 2.5 even in the smallest babies unless it's very difficult. A carbon dioxide detector can be used. Measuring tape or AET tape insertion depth table. So the measuring tape is for measuring the nose tragus length the waterproof tape or tape securing device and scissors. In terms of medication, we need to have access to epinephrine. If you don't have one in 10,000, you need to keep it diluted in advance because you don't want to waste time. Uh, normal saline, preferably pre-filled syringes. Supplies for placing emergency UVC and administering medication. You should also make sure that your crash cart has intraoceous needle for babies. And the table of the calculated drug dosages is important as well. So coming to the initial steps which we discussed already in the algorithm review, for most vigorous term and preterm babies, clamping the umbilical cord should be delayed for at least 30 to 60 seconds. All the newborns require a rapid evaluation. So whether the, term, whether the baby is term or preterm, whether the muscle tone is normal and whether the baby is breathing or crying. If the answer is no to any of these, the newborn should be brought to the radiant warmer for the initial steps of newborn care. The five initial steps are to warm, dry, stimulate, position. Head and neck uh, should be kept in the sniffing position or neutral position to open the airway and we have to clear the secretions if needed. Use the pulse oximetry to guide the oxygenation. So when the resuscitation is anticipated to confirm if the baby has cyanosis, if you feel there is cyanosis, if you need supplemental oxygen, it's better to monitor oxygen and if PPV is required. so. Pulse oximeter is needed in short in any baby who needs additional support, not someone who transitions quickly to uh, skin to skin care with the mother. If meconium stain fluid is present and the baby is not vigorous, bring the baby to the radiant warmer to perform the initial steps. Routine laryngoscopy uh, with or without intubation or for tracheal suction is not suggested. So, Meconium uh, stain liquor, you do the meconium uh, aspiration only if Mr. Sopa uh, steps for suction is there and the baby's chest is not moving despite IPPV. So uh, here it is to show the steps. We already discussed that. So the sequence is much clearer now. You warm, receive the baby in the warmer in a dry towel, dry and stimulate, which happens together. Position the airway and suction if needed. And... Uh, the correct sniffing position should not be over extension in a newborn baby. So 
the forehead facing the roof is adequate and in the baby's uh, shoulder roll placed in the right position under the shoulder helps to keep the because the occiput is large it helps to maintain the neutral position so because we use a sniffing position to an overextended head in older kids we can use the term neutral position if that is confusing in terms of clearing the secretion remember to clear the mouth first before you uh, clear the nose because the mouth has lots more secretions and putting the bulb sucker in the nose will trigger the gasping response in the baby may aspirate again only if uh, secretions are visible so there is no role for elective suction uh, we discussed the situations where pulse oximetry is needed so when resuscitation is anticipated to confirm perception of central cyanosis when supplemental oxygen is administered or when ppv is required so it's better to use the right upper limb you can uh, keep the pulse oximeter off uh, or you can keep it on on uh, with the standby but the probe is not connected to the main machine uh, once the baby has the probe on the skin then you can connect uh, the probe to the machine which is switched on already and that is shown to pick up these sensor quicker usually it takes around 1 minute after you make the decision to get the reading so the earlier you decide the better and this is the chart which we discussed earlier for the transition of oxygen don't uh, rush it i mean obviously uh, 100% oxygen is needed if you need chest compression but in all other situations you start with uh, gradual steps of increment and you can see the response and decide if a baby needs positive pressure ventilation the ventilation itself will open the lungs oxygen is needed if there is lung disease like premature babies with rts so if you are giving supplemental oxygen you don't need to have a seal so keeping it close to the baby is enough and remember that the bag and mask the self inflating bag is not a good device to give this uh, because only when you press the bag the oxygen flow comes reliably so some gas flow does happen when the flow is high enough but you can't rely on it so you can use the tps device with the mask kept a little away the oxygen blender can be set to a higher level when you are giving free flow oxygen or you can give plain oxygen uh, ambu bag can be used uh, the anesthesia bag when you are giving cpap remember that the seal is important you can see the tps uh, cpap adjuster valve here and you can see the cpap delivery on the machine which is kept behind you and make sure the seal is effective and the airway is clear positive pressure ventilation is needed uh, and as we discussed because respiratory failure is the most important reason to need resuscitation uh, it's the most important step so don't go on to the further steps in resuscitation unless you have attained open lungs so ppv is indicated if the baby is not breathing that is the baby is apneic fully or if the baby is gasping which indicates it's ineffective breathing or the baby's heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute the most important indicator for successful ppv is a rising heart rate so the settings for oxygen as we discussed for 35 and above 21% and less than 35 21 to 30% so below 32 you'd always go for 30% and under 28 you can even go for 40% we are still waiting for the results of torpedo 2 and so on which will guide us better probably the gas flow you don't fiddle around with the gas flow because the pressure settings depend on the flow so sometimes if you inadvertently increase it the pressure delivered to the baby will increase and that increases the chance of air leak so always educate your team that the flow doesn't change once you have set the initial pressures the rate is 40 to 60 breaths which obviously you will be delivering it the pip 20 to 25 cm of water you may have to increase it this is one of the areas where some people prefer a bag if the baby has stiff lungs because you can increase quicker seeing the response within breath to breath but here you have to go in stages you can go from 25 to 30 directly if you have a stiff lung in a term baby or from 20 to 25 directly in a preterm baby with stiff lungs and once the lung opens if you are able to get effective breathing you can reduce it back to the same level the peep is usually fixed at 5 cm in these babies if the effective ventilation is not delivered you have to assess if the heart rate is not increasing within the first 15 seconds of ppv or you don't observe chest movement the person accompanying should say that Uh, the ventilation is not effective so you don't go on with the same steps unless there is effective chest rise and the steps of mr sopa mr sopa is to make sure you attain effective ventilation so mask readjustment 
reposition the head and neck. So these two were quickly done at the same time. As I said, you may need a shoulder roll at this stage. Make sure the mask is at the right size. If it's not, you change it and see. And the seal should be effective with the CE clamp. Uh, don't put undue pressure below the chin. The soft tissue may compress the airway as well. Uh, the next step is to suction the mouth and nose. Use a bulb shaker or suction catheter. If it is meconium stain liquor, this is the stage where you would consider uh, intubating and using a tracheal aspirator. Opening the mouth in UK, uh, the NLS trains you to use a Giddel airway uh, or uh, two, 200 jaw thrust if you have another resuscitator. In the NRP, it suggests using a finger to gently open the mouth to make sure the tongue is supported and coming forward. Uh, in terms of uh, pressure increase, if you know the uh, airways, the mask seal and everything is good, there is no secretion, then you try increasing the pressure. Maximum of 40 for term baby and 30 for premature, you can go in steps of 5 increment. And give 5 breaths and assess chest movement. If no chest movement, then you need an alternative airway. Intubation is preferred, obviously. And if you have not considered a monitor, you can uh, put on a cardiac monitor at this stage. If intubation is difficult or you don't have a suitable intubator, you can go for laryngeal mask. In a very premature baby, less than 34 weeks, the laryngeal mask is likely not to fit, so you may use intubation directly. So, uh, three types of devices are used for ventilation. You have the self-inflating bag. You always need to have a self-inflating bag by the bedside in case of emergency, like you need to move the baby where there is no gas flow, like a fire hazard and so on, or when you are uh, losing gas supply during the transport. So, always keep the self-inflating bag in the system because it's uh, very useful from this point of view if there is no gas flow. The other two devices both need a reliable gas flow, preferably an oxygen blender should be an essential part of the resuscitation equipment. So the TP's resuscitator is mainly preferred because we have the PIP and the PEEP, both can be regulated. You can also adjust the uh, inspiratory time according to how long you press it. So the rate, rhythm, everything is better controlled. As I said, the only advantage of the mask bag mask with the self-inflating bag is the quick increase in pressure that you may do if the baby's chest is stiff. But the disadvantage is obviously that you don't monitor the pressure unless you have a manometer and you may give excessive pressures. Laryngeal mask airway, if the baby cannot be successfully ventilated with a face mask and intubation is uh, unfeasible, then you may use uh, laryngeal mask. So we have also discussed uh, that the uh, laryngeal mask is preferred in the NICU scenarios as well if the baby needs ventilation for longer than a few breaths. So there is less leak, uh, the effectiveness is better and you may uh, more successfully resuscitate. If the ventilation with the mask is prolonged, many times we see that the seal loosens up and you may need to keep adjusting it. So keep an eye on that. So uh, if you continue face mask for a longer time, uh, orogastric tube should be inserted to act as a vent for gas in the stomach. Otherwise, you will get gastric distension, which pushes the diaphragm up. It will collapse the lungs more and make it more difficult to ventilate the baby. So this is the laryngeal mask airway. Different types are available. Most of them are the size uh, 1, the size 0. We are awaiting it, which can be used in babies uh, up to 1 kilo. Many people have reported even using this size for babies 1.5 kilo or so, though the uh, license is about 2 kilos. And this is how it will sit in the airway. This is the opening of the larynx and this will just sit over it. So gastric distension is reduced. It's more effective and you can even give surfactant through a feeding tube which is inserted if there is a separate port. That's called salsa. So unlike in older children and adults, the direction of insertion is the natural way. You don't revert it and you put it in and uh, push it till there is resistance. Then you inflate if the model needs inflation and then secure it as you would secure an ET tube. Intubation is strongly recommended if the heart rate remains less than 100 and not increasing after effective PPV. It's strongly recommended before starting chest compression. If intubation is not successful or feasible and the baby is more than 2 kilo, LMA can be used. As I said, more than 1.5 kilo is an option as well. For direct tracheal suction, if trachea is obstructed by thick secretions like meconium, 
We also need to intubate if we need surfactant administration in a premature baby with RDS or immediate stabilization of a baby with suspected diaphragmatic hernia. So this is one indication where you avoid PPV with the mask, you intubate the baby directly before you give any breaths if possible to avoid the gaseous distension of the intestine which may compromise your initial management. If PPV is prolonged, endotracheal tube may be considered to improve the efficacy. So it's not a must at this stage, but if you have a persistent need, it will make it easier and more effective. And also once you shift to the NICU, you can assess the blood gas and maybe extubate electively. So a person with intubation skills should be in the hospital and available to be called for immediate assistance if needed. If the need for uh, intubation is anticipated, the person should be present in the delivery room at the time of birth. It's not sufficient to have someone on call at home or in a remote area. And the appropriate laryngoscope blade for a term baby is size 1 and for a preterm is size 0. If you have babies uh, below 750 gram, S00 becomes important as well. Video laryngoscopy is available if you have it in your hospital. It's a useful tool for teaching as well. Uh, intubation procedure should be completed within 30 seconds. The end tidal CO2, there is a separate video on calorimetry in my uh, playlist, so you can go through that. We need to change, uh, see the change in color, yellow for yes, which means the tube is in the right place. So the CO2 coming out doesn't happen in some situations where the perfusion is poor uh, and there is not enough blood coming to the lungs to get the CO2 back out. So if the baby is in shock, uh, if the baby has not had any effective ventilation, you may not see the color change. So you may need to visualize uh, with the laryngoscope to see if the ET tube is in the right place. Don't rush to pull it out if the baby doesn't, if the CO2 doesn't change, if the intubator is confident the tube is in. The length of uh, insertion is by the nasal tragus length uh, or using the baby's gestational age. And uh, even if you have used these measurements, the position should be confirmed by auscultating equal breath sounds. And uh, if the tube has to stay in place, you obtain a chest X-ray for confirmation. If the correctly inserted endotracheal tube does not result in chest movement with PPV, suspect airway obstruction or a pneumothorax and you have to deal with it accordingly. Avoid success, unsuccessful repeated attempts. If a baby uh, weighs more than 2 kilo or 1.5 and above, you can use LMA if uh, repeated intubation attempts fail. Some babies have abnormal airways which make intubation difficult. A baby with cleft palate or a small chin, you may need to call the anesthetist for the expertise. So uh, in terms of tube size, below 1 kilo and below 28 weeks, 2.5, 1 to 2 kilo, 3, and greater than 2 kilo, 3.5. So a leak around the tube, once you shift to the NICU money, people change the tube if there is a leak. But don't worry, most of us are extubating early. You don't need to rush to extubate these babies. And having a small tube is actually an advantage because you won't face laryngeal edema when you extubate. So you may not need to use volume guarantee for these babies who are going to extubate quickly. If the baby needs to continue ventilation, is not extubating soon within a few hours, then you may consider reintubating. This is, of course, a separate point not related to NRP. The suction catheter size, uh, 2.5 will allow 5 or 6, and 3 will allow 6 or 8, and 3.5, 8 French is preferred. And these are the equipment needed for intubation, which we discussed earlier. So uh, remember to be gentle, the pull forward, uh, the direction should be away from the baby at 90 degrees. There should not be pressure tilting back on the gums uh, to damage the gums or cause bleeding. Once you reach the valicula, if you see only darkness, it means you've gone too deep, you may need to pull back. And once you see the epiglottis, it shows you are close to the right area. You can pull forward from there to see the ocal cords. And you'll see the anatomy like this, so the epiglottis, the valicula, uh, if you go into here, you pull forward and sometimes you may go over the epiglottis to see the cords, the direction of the cord is towards the epiglottis. The uh, area arytenoid folds are seen here and that is a esophagus. And once you have the calorimetry to confirm yes and yellow, remember that, purple is uh, no. And uh, once the color change happens, some of these calorimeters need a strip to be pulled out, so don't forget to pull it out and always uh, secure the tube against the pallet so it doesn't slip out before you fix it. So there is nothing more disheartening than intubating a very sick baby and the tube slipping out because you didn't hold on properly. Communicate well within the team if someone is going to pull the uh, uh, bagging device or the etc to sensor, uh, tell each other so that it doesn't slip. Always secure it well. 
And as I mentioned earlier, don't remove the calorimeter uh, after you have confirmed. Keep it till you reach the NICO because the tube can slip during the movement as well. This is a chart for the uh, depth of insertion. In addition to the uh, nose to trigger's length plus one, uh, you can use this. And also the weight in kilo plus six can be considered as well if you are uh, not sure of the gestation. So 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 kilo, 0.5.5, that's the smallest usually you keep, shortest length. 25 to 26 weeks, six centimeter, and then it keeps increasing. At term, it's nine centimeter. If the baby worsens after intubation, you have to use a dope mnemonic even in the resuscitation scenario. D stands for displaced ET tube, O for obstructed ET tube. Uh, it can happen even with secretions, not necessarily meconium alone. P for pneumothorax and E for equipment failure. So the dope as well, there is a separate video on the playlist. Chest compressions are indicated when the heart rate remains less than 60 beats per minute despite at least 30 seconds of PPV that opens the lungs. So we have seen chest movement. In most cases, you should have given ventilation through a properly inserted ET tube or laryngeal mask because the baby didn't improve ideally. Before chest compression, you have an alternative airway in place because that makes coordination much easier and uh, holding the seal with the mask when the baby is moving with the chest compression can be challenging and you also free up one hand. Inaccurate assessment of heart rate can result in unnecessary cardiac compression, so having the cardiac monitor is uh, useful. Uh, you need to wipe the baby's chest and be prepared to stick it on. Of course, the pulse oximeter is a sense, uh, suitable measure as well. If the chest is not moving with PPV, the lungs have not been inflated and chest compressions are not yet indicated, so focus on achieving effective ventilation with Mr. Sopa steps. Keep repeating the steps, call for more help and more expertise if you can't manage. Once the ET tube or LMA is secure, move to the head end of the bed to give chest compression. So this provides space for safe insertion of the UVC. It's always important to anticipate the next step and move on from that. So you don't waste time. The <coughs> head end of the bed, you are also in a better position to result in less compressor fatigue. It's a two thumb method that's used. If the heart rate is less than 60, the pulse oximeter may not have a reliable signal. So always debrief your team that you shouldn't enter the pulse oximeter readings in the resuscitation scenario unless you have spontaneous circulation. So it often fluctuates a lot, especially when chest compressions are used. So I've seen team members entering the heart rate as uh, 120 when actually it was the chest compression related heartbeat and uh, in inform them this is the reason we debrief in the end and also review the documentation. When chest compressions begin, ventilate using 100% oxygen because you cannot rely on the pulse oximeter signal for titrating the oxygen and also the baby is very sick and a brief exposure to 100% should not be harmful. You need a quickest response possible. Once the heart rate is above 60 and the pulse oximeter has a reliable signal, then you titrate downwards. You can titrate down fairly quickly if the saturation is maintained. So obviously we have the internipple line and one finger breadth, the lower third of the sternum, avoiding the ziffy sternum and you have to go one third of the AP diameter of the chest, which is roughly four centimeter. The baby should be on a flat surface and you can encircle to give the uh, firmness behind and the two thumb method is recommended in the NRP. The two finger method is still taught in the BLS, but in terms of NRP, the two finger, uh, because you have usually more people in the labor room scenario. Use enough downward pressure to depress the sternum, approximately one third of the AP diameter of the chest. So the rate is 90 compressions per minute and the breathing rate is 30 breaths, so 120 events per minute. This is a slower ventilation rate than used, which is 40 to 60 if you are just giving ventilation breaths. And you can use the cadence of 1 and 2 and 3 and breathe. When you say breathe, the person doing the breathing gives the breath. After 60 seconds of chest compression and ventilation, briefly stop and check the heart rate. Mostly you'll have the cardiac monitor attached, so you can see the rhythm as well. Very rare to have a shockable rhythm in the newborn. Asystole is a commonest rhythm, but you may have uh, electromechanical dissociation frequently in the resuscitation scenario. So you may have the ECG showing leads, but the pulse may not reach the baby. So always uh, see the improvement in the baby's condition. When you do see the heart rate improving and you're giving IPPV, but baby, still remains pale, you have to consider electromechanical dissociation and continue chest compression, consider medication. 
You may also assess the baby's heart rate by listening with the stethoscope and you may need to briefly stop ventilation to auscultate the heart rate. If the heart rate is 60 breaths per minute or greater, discontinue compression, resume PPV at 40 to 60 breaths per minute and uh, when the pulse oximeter signal is achieved in a reliable way, you adjust the oxygen saturation uh, concentration to the saturation. If the heart rate remains less than 60, despite 60 seconds of effective ventilation, high quality coordinated chest compression, then epinephrine is administered and emergency vascular access is needed. So you may consider ET epinephrine for the first dose and then UVC uh, epinephrine for subsequent doses. Every three to five minutes you repeat it and also look at hypovolemia, hypotension, blood loss, pneumothorax and so on. So in terms of coordinated compression and ventilation, three compressions to one ventilation roughly every two seconds. So you have 120 events and uh, one and two and breathe. So three is to one rhythm. If the heart rate is not improving with compression before you go for the medication, you review the mnemonic cardio. Chest movement is the chest moving with each breath. Remember that the tube can get displaced and you need to apply the dope. Is the airway secured? Uh, are the three compressions coordinated with one ventilation? Is the depth of compression one third of the AP diameter? Is 100% oxygen being given? So if this is being done, then you go for medication. Epinephrine is indicated if the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute after at least 30 seconds of PPV that inflates the lung as evidenced by chest movement and another 60 seconds of chest compression coordinated with PPV using 100% oxygen. In most cases, ventilation should be provided through a properly inserted ET tube or LMA so you have reliable ventilation. Epinephrine is not indicated before you have established ventilation that inflates. Obviously, even chest compression is not indicated before this stage. So the dose is 0.1 mg per ml epinephrine uh, or 1 mg in 10 ml strength. Uh, 1 in 10,000 is what we used to say. And adrenaline word is pref uh, less preferred over use of epinephrine to have standard nomenclature. Intravenous is preferred or intraosseous. Endotracheal is only while the access is being established to bite time. And remember the uh, flush is 3 ml saline and endotracheal should be a 3 to 5 ml syringe, no flush is needed for ET. Intravenous or intraosseous is 0 0.02 mg per kilogram and a range of 0.01 to 0 0.03 mg. So if you are communicating, be clear whether you are speaking in terms of milligram or ml and stick to that within the team. If you have 1 in 10,000 as a only strength, then remembering the ml per kilo is easier as it's 0 0.2 ml per kilo. And the endotracheal dose is 0.1 milligram or 1 ml per kilo. So the dose when it is given intravenous should be as quickly as possible, flush with 3 ml normal saline and repeat every 3 minutes. So suppose you have given the first dose endotracheal and the baby continues to need chest compression. If the UVC is in, you don't need to wait for this 3 to 5 minutes because ET dose is recognized as not an effective dose. So the first assessment after the UVC is in if the heart rate is less, even if it is just one or two minutes after the ET dose, you can give the IV dose as a first dose and then start this three to five minute cycle. Endotracheal uh, administer PPV after the dose to distribute into the lungs, there is no flush. Volume expander is indicated if the baby is not responding to the steps of resuscitation and there are signs of shock or a history of acute blood loss. Even if there are no signs of shock or blood loss history, you may give a 10 ml per kilo saline bolus because the heart rate is not improving after the epinephrine given IV. Uh, normal saline or type O RH negative blood is preferred if there is evidence of blood loss. Intravenous or intraosseous can be given and a 30 or 60 ml syringe because it's a term baby 10 ml per kilo, you'll need 30 ml. Uh, rate over 5 to 10 minutes, a quick push. In a premature baby, you may need to be slower uh, and you don't usually go for a 20 ml per kilo dose in a premature baby, though in a term baby, you may consider 10 to 20. So UVC insertion kit. So one of the tips is to have a plastic bag with a UVC kit in it. Many times if you have it uh, lying in the crash cart in a half a hour way, it's difficult to pick out, especially the blade, the artery forceps, the tie. Uh, these are very important. Uh, it's not a sterile procedure exactly in the labor room. However, you try to be as aseptic as you can. Use sterile gloves and have a sterile field if possible, but it needs to be done quickly. 
the depth of insertion is different in the labor room scenario as well you don't aim to go to the typical position and you just need to insert a 4 to 5 cm and get enough blood back and then when, if you want to keep this UVC again you may need to reinsert it in a more sterile way in the NICU and with the appropriate depth measurement. Most of us have the intraseous uh, drill which makes intraseous uh, placement very easy. The upper tibia, the medial aspect is preferred. If you don't have uh, option here due to any reason, you can consider the lower femur uh, as an option as well. So we discussed the cardio acronym already for uh, inadequate improvement. Then you also look at epinephrine dose, whether it was given intravenously and whether you have a line in place and whether there is a pneumothorax, you may need to call an urgent x-ray if there is inadequate response. So obviously these are babies where we are really stuck, where improvement is not happening despite the best of resuscitation and that's where the question of when to stop resuscitation comes in. So if there is a confirmed absence of heart rate after all the appropriate steps of resuscitation has been performed, cessation should be discussed with the team and always involve the family. They don't understand, they must be in a state of shock. Obviously communication may not be easy so you need someone dedicated to communicating with the family who is experienced, who understands exactly what is happening as well. So the leader of the team may need to delegate another leader and go and speak to the family. A, responsible, a reasonable time frame is 20 minutes of effective resuscitation. So this is where the team has to decide since when the resuscitation became effective. So if initially the IPPV was not given effectively, you don't count that time. From the time you have a good airway in place, once you started the chest uh, moving, uh, once you have the chest compression starting. So you start from the time you have effective resuscitation starting. Premature babies are at increased risk of needing resuscitation uh, with transition after birth because of rapid heat loss, immature organ systems and smaller blood volume. They are also more vulnerable to hypoglycemia though it doesn't really impact the resuscitation scenario unless you are looking at spontaneous breathing effort. We need definitely skilled personnel and in babies less than 32 weeks a polyethylene plastic bag. Uh, you can review my playlist on thermoregulation to understand why the plastic bag helps because you are keeping the insensible water loss. So whatever is lost is within the bag. You create a highly humid environment. Otherwise, in a very small baby temperature, may lose quickly with the evaporation. Uh, we need preterm sized masks and endotracheal tubes and possibly a double zero blade. Delayed cot clamping is very important in a premature baby because the blood volume is on the lower side and uh, the baby is prone for hypotension being a sicker baby. There is an increased risk of IVH if there is hemodynamic compromise. So that's why IVH rate or severe IVH reduces with delayed cot clamping in preterm babies. And uh, I have mentioned this before as well. Speak to your obstetric team that a premature baby is often not going to be active at the time of birth. Just feel the cord pulsation and if it is a normal heartbeat more than 100, please do the delayed cord clamping because this is blood that should uh, be in the baby. The reason it is in the placenta is because the lung is not breathing. Once the lung starts opening up, as I showed you, the lung blood vessels expand and this blood should come back to the baby. Surfactant should be available within quick access if needed and the temperature should be kept 24 degrees if you remember that's fine. If a baby is less than 32 weeks, a polyethylene bag and a thermal mattress should be prepared. If PPV is required, use the lowest inflation pressure necessary to achieve and maintain adequate heart rate. It is preferable to use a device that can provide PEEP and consider using CPAP immediately after birth if the baby is breathing spontaneously with a heart rate of at least 100. So irrespective of the size of the baby, we can use non-invasive ventilation with CPAP from the labor room effectively and then consider surfactant early if needed. You can review my recent video on pragmatic approach to respiratory management to guide this. And to reduce the risk of neurologic injury, we have to handle the baby gently, avoid positioning the baby's legs higher than the head, avoid high PPV or CPAP pressures, use pulse oximeter and blood gases to adjust ventilation and oxygen, and avoid rapid intravenous fluid infusion. So most of these are components of both the golden hour as well as the uh, IVH prevention bundle. Uh, I've shared the recent video on IVH prevention bundle as well, which you can review on the channel. If there are any videos which I've mentioned which you're not able to find, please comment and I can share the link there. So uh, 
you can do labor room CPAP using any suitable interface that you have and it's easier to transport the baby on uh, in nasal interface and ventilator CPAP rather than holding the TP's device uh, mask on the face while you move. So temperature management, uh, handling the baby, everything is easier. It's easier for the personal concerned as well. So train your team to do this in an effective way. So uh, I hope uh, this is useful. And uh, if you have any questions, do comment. Thank you.